Elia Kazan, throughout his life, always felt like an outsider who wanted in. Even so, he is known, right along with Orson Welles, as the most disruptive force in modern American cinema, and has been revered by directors such as Godard, Truffaut, and Rivette. What did this landmark director have to go through in order to achieve such success? First of all, Elia Kazan had to fight through a rough childhood. Born in Anatolian Greek in 1909 in a suburb of Istanbul, he grew up battling life-threatening racial persecution. In 1913, Kazan's family was finally able to move to America thanks to Elia's uncle with an American carpet business in New York. Because his father was very paranoid, Kazan grew up rarely having the opportunity to enjoy the company of other kids. Furthermore, because he decided not to follow in his father's footsteps in the family business, he was referred to as a good-for-nothing and was often beaten by his father. For Kazan, school is an escape from all of this turmoil, so he spent a lot of time reading and studying. When he graduated from high school, he went off to Williams College in 1926 and majored in English. After discovering the work of Sergei Eisenstein, he decided to go to Yale Drama School and study acting, directing, set design, and costuming, all of which would play a large role in his future as a filmmaker. After leaving Yale a year premature, he moved to New York City and joined the group theater, which was made up of many leftist and radical actors and directors. There he learned the method style of acting, which he would later introduce to film. The group theater also had a film branch known as Nikino, where Kazan was able to co-direct his first picture, People of Cumberland. Though he continued to act for the theater at this time for several years, Kazan eventually decided to give up that area of life and solely pursue directing. A few years later, after directing some minor plays, Kazan directed Café Crown, which was unexpectedly very successful. Because of this great success, he was offered to direct The Skin of Our Teeth, which won many awards and much critical acclaim, causing Hollywood producers to go after him. In 1944, he signed a contract with Fox to direct five films in five years. He then went on to release A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, Sea of Grass, Boomerang, Gentleman's Agreement, and Pinky. During this time, in 1947, Kazan directed the theater play known as A Streetcar Named Desire. Because of the huge success of this play, Warner Brothers pushed him to direct a film version, which, when it was released in 1951, was also highly successful. Hey, Stella! Kazan had fought through a tough life and made it to the top. His success was, however, cut short. During the Red Scare, the House Committee on Un-American Activities pressured many directors and writers associated with the Communist Party, including Elia Kazan, to disclose names of other Communist Party members in Hollywood, with the threat of being blacklisted. Because Kazan chose to testify, he lost many relationships with others in the industry, including playwright Arthur Miller. However, this all ended when Kazan released his next film, On the Waterfront, in 1954. This film is the quintessential Kazan film, for it is a perfect example of his use of symbolism, his ability to direct actors, and his favorite subject, social problems. This film won eight Oscars and is now regarded as a classic. And on the waterfront, Kazan very effectively expresses injustices of the waterfront society through visual images, lighting, and location shooting. The visual symbolism is evident in nearly every scene. In this opening image, the small clubhouse of the corrupt union is compared to the vast waterfront, showing how a very small group of people controlled a very large group of people. Kazan symbolically used dark lighting when he revealed the true nature of the unions. Furthermore, all of the murder scenes took place in low and gloomy places. In this scene, Joy Doyle is thrown from a rooftop to his death in a dimly lit street. I think somebody fell off the roof. Here, the mobsters murder Dugan, a waterfront worker, deep down in the hold of a ship. In this scene, near the end of the film, the main character, Terry Malloy, is nearly killed right down by the water's edge. Kazan uses much visual symbolism with Terry Malloy as he struggles to decide whether he should testify against the Union or keep his mouth shut. As in this scene, Terry is often shown behind fences, up on rooftops, and alone. Even pigeons aren't peaceful. Well, well one thing about them, though, they're very faithful. They get married just like people. Better. This film also has many Christian undertones, even though Kazan was in no way a Christian man. 
Father Barry is a strong John the Baptist figure in this film, for he prepares the way for Terry Molloy to testify. Also, he gives one of the most powerful sermons ever in film, known as Christ in the Shape Up. You see that? You want to know what's wrong with our waterfront? It's the love of a lousy buck. It's making love of a buck, the cushy job, more important than the love of man. It's forgetting that every fella down here is your brother in Christ. But remember, Christ is always with you. Christ is in the shape up, he's in the hatch, he's in the unit. He's kneeling right here beside Dugan. And he's staying with all of you. If you do it to the least of mine, you do it to me. Just as Father Barry is a John the Baptist figure, Terry Malloy is a Christ figure, for he sacrifices himself for his fellow man. And, at the end of the film, is, in a way, resurrected to lead his fellow workers into the docks. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. Terry and his brother can also be seen as representations of Cain and Abel. In this famous taxi scene, Terry exposes how his brother Charlie betrayed him. For the short end money. Well, I had some bets down for you. You saw some money. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's face it. Future. On the Waterfront is so full of visual symbolism and social significance that it is no wonder that this film won so many awards and put Ali Kazan back on top as a director. After this film, Kazan went on to direct many other good films including A Face in the Crowd, Splendor in the Grass, The Visitors, and The Last Tycoon. At the end of his life, Kazan was pleased with what he had done. He had overcome failures, hardships, and struggles, and he had greatly impacted his world. One of his greatest innovations was the introduction of the Stanislavski method of acting to American film. The Stanislavski method it originated with the Moscow Art Theater and taught actors to, in essence, become their characters by thinking their thoughts, keeping an interior monologue, and having all actions and thoughts be justified by the character and by the script. Because Kazan learned this from the group theater, he was able to apply it to his films. His best student was Marlon Brando. Brando was able to get so deep into a character that he brought them to life, as he did in A Streetcar Named Desire, On the Waterfront, and, under the direction of Francis Ford Coppola, The Godfather, and Apocalypse Now. Horror. Horror has a face. And you must make a friend of horror. Horror and moral terror are your friends. If they are not, then they are enemies to be feared. They are truly enemies. Kazan also had a big impact on leftist filmmaking. Most of his films and plays dealt with the corruption of powerful people or groups of people, the power of the individual, and racism. Even when the socialists disowned Kazan, he still stood strong for what he believed in. By the end of his filmmaking career, Kazan was truly a loner in the world of film and an outsider looking in upon America, with a purpose similar to that of John the Baptist of the New Testament. On the one hand, he suffered because he did not have any support from either Hollywood or anti-Hollywood socialists. On the other hand, he had nobody to please and he was afraid of no one. He made films that did not belong to any certain genre and he was associated with no special organization or group of people. Because of this, he was able to expose through his films, without fear, some of America's worst qualities, such as racism, the abuse of power, the corruption of leaders, the generation gap, and the misconception of love and devotion. Elia Kazan, with his extensive career in theater and film, was truly an innovator. He helped to drastically change the way actors go about portraying characters. He also proved to be a nearly perfect example of how a person is capable of standing strong in a world full of all kinds of pressures and opposing opinions. However, these are just the largest of his many innovations. Kazan also developed the use of on-location shooting, helped reduce the use of stereotypes, increased the use of literate scripts, and improved the way that directors block out scenes and rehearse them with their actors. It is fascinating that one man brought about so many changes in film techniques and aesthetics, one man who, interestingly enough, throughout his life stressed the power that one person can have to bring about change. Where would film be today without such an inventive and groundbreaking director?